Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felden. Okay, good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and uh, we've got folks from uh, Minnesota, California, Alabama. Did I miss anybody? Florida. Florida? Yeah, yeah, Jim's right here from Florida. Sorry about that, Jim. Okay, for those of you out in television, in case you're just a new listener, we're an informal Bible study, and uh, we uh, try not to get preachy. I don't want to get theological per se, but we just want to teach the book verse by verse and uh, line upon line and precept upon precept. And uh, we uh, have been blessed. My, we're getting so many people that are seeing things they've never seen before, and I do. My goodness, you know, I see things that I never, never heard 30, 40 years ago. And uh, so that's the whole idea. So those of you joining us, we again thank you for your prayers. That's most of all for your prayers. We thank you for your kind letters, and then we thank you for your financial help because after all, these things do have to be paid for, and uh, you've been picking up the bill every month, and we thank you from the depths of our heart. Okay, we're going to continue on with the redemption of the planet. Now, we talked about the redemption that God promised back in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve were first out of the garden. And uh, then we spoke of some other times of redemption, like Israel coming out of Egypt. That was an act of redemption. And uh, then we looked at the work of the cross, how that in itself is the work of redemption for the whole human race. And it can be appropriated only by faith. Now, we have to make that clear because I had the question come in again the other day. Since God performed the work of the cross, which was sufficient for every human being, well, does that mean that sooner or later everybody's going to get to heaven? Don't you ever think it. But only those who appropriate this finished work by faith. You know, and I'm always giving the illustration, even Congress. Congress can appropriate billions and billions of dollars for a particular purpose. We'll say for highways. But the several states have to make application. They have to appropriate that which Congress has set aside. Otherwise, it just stays there. Well, now that's the work of salvation. God has finished it. It's satisfactory for every human being that's on the planet. But... They have to personally appropriate it by faith. And that's what we keep emphasizing. If I got time this afternoon, I'm hoping to uh, get into one of my favorite gospel passages, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And uh, I just can't imagine why it's not used more often, but it isn't. But we're going to if I have time. So anyway, then we looked at redemption, I think, as Paul uh, perceived it in Galatians when he said he came to redeem them who were under the law. And now we're looking at the redemption of the planet. Now, we're ha going to have to go to the book of Ruth after a bit because when we come down to the redemption of the planet, we have to understand that when Adam fell, and he lost that dominion. Now I guess we better, I got everybody in Revelation 5, don't I? <laughs> well, let's go back. Chapter 1 of Genesis. Keep your hand in Revelation. I'll be right back. I remember years ago when we were still in the original studio and uh, a gentleman and his wife have now moved to Phoenix. They aren't on the program anymore, but Monty and Helen always used to sit on the front row and I would do just like I did today. Okay, I'm going to be starting out at such and such a chapter and such and such a verse. And Monty would look up and he says, you want to bet on it? <laughs> but that's the way I teach. You can't help it. Okay, back to Genesis chapter 1. When God is now making the promises to Adam in uh, chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them and he said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth or fill it up, subdue it. Now look at the next statement. Now this is to Adam. 
and have dominion over the Garden of Eden. Is that what your Bible says? No. That's what everybody's got the idea, that the only place that Adam had any authority was in the Garden. No, he had the whole planet. That was his dominion, see? Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Was all that in Eden? Well, of course not. Of course not. So what does it tell you? Adam's dominion was the whole planet. It was all his to have control of, under God, of course. But, all right, but when Adam sinned, when he disobeyed God by the simple act of eating of the tree, what happened to that dominion? He lost it. Who picked it up? Satan. Never forget that. Adam dropped the ball, and just that quick Satan picks it up. Consequently, then, for the last 6,000 years, who's been the God of this world? Satan. Oh, under God's sovereignty, we don't take anything away from that. But Satan has been the God of this world for the last 6,000 years. Now, somebody like, you know, is going to say, well, now, where do you find that in Scripture? Well, there are several places. Let's stop first one in Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, because I want to establish it with my whole television and radio and Internet audience, that Satan has been the God of this world for the last 6,000 years. And the only way that God can wrest control from him is to redeem it. He's going to pay the price. All right? Matthew chapter 4. And it's when the Lord is being tempted by Satan. But we'll just look at one of them. Verse 8. Matthew 4, verse 8. And as you look at the different scriptures, don't forget what we're talking about. We're going to show now that Satan is in control of this world. So I didn't Christ's earthly ministry. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceeding high mountain. Now, as I was mulling this over the last few days, how many of you have seen a picture of the globe from outer space? I'm sure you all have. That beautiful, round, various black, blue and white globe. Well, I like to think that whatever this high mountain was, it was high enough that Jesus, in his human form, with Satan, could just see the whole planet. Now, that's just my own idea. But whatever. He takes him up to an exceeding high mountain and shows him all. See, that's why I had to think. It had to be from a tremendously high vantage point. And he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, that means what it says, and it says what it means. He saw them all. Now, since they were both eternal creatures, Satan as well as the Lord himself, I think Satan took him in, in mentally at least, all the way past the past empires of, of Rome, which was now on the scene, and back through the Greek Empire, the Mede Empire, and the Babylonians, all of the beauty of that. And I also think he projected into the future. And so he gives the Lord Jesus this whole view of planet Earth in all of its empires. Now look what the individual, the creature says. I just about said something that wouldn't have been kind. But Satan is a rascal. Look what he says. All these things, everything pertaining to the planet and the empires and the cities and the parks and you name it, all these things I will give you. Now remember, who's talking? Satan. And he's telling Jesus that all these things that they've been viewing of planet Earth, he says, I will give them to you if you will fall down and worship me. Well, now you've heard me ask the question more than once. Were they Satan's to give? Well, of course. Of course. He's the God of this world. But, you see, the Lord could very well have said, that's fine, Satan. I'm going to have them someday without you. But he didn't. But all right, now let's just move ahead a little bit to Corinthians. 
Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 3 and 4, honey. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Drop down to verse 3. Now this is what the book says. Now whenever I put out something that I think is my own idea, I'm always hopeful anyway that I, I express it that way. But when the book says it, I want you to know it's what the book says. All right, verse 3. Where Paul now writes, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Why? Next verse. In whom? Lost people of this world. In whom the God of this world. Who's he talking about? Satan. Satan, the devil. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them who believe not. Has he got the power to do it? Absolutely. And that's why we're always emphasizing it takes the work of the Holy Spirit to come through and open the understanding of that lost person because Satan's power is going to do everything he can to keep them from it. In the same way, when I'm always exclaiming the power of the resurrection, why do I put so much on the power of the resurrection? Because Christ had to break through all the powers of the satanic forces in order to overcome and become victorious. Well, the same way here, see? The lost of this world are just literally encompassed with the power of Satan. And he's going to keep them there if he possibly can. But you see, the spirit is still above the powers of Satan, and the spirit can still break through and open the hearts and minds to bring people to a knowledge or at least have the opportunity to have the knowledge of salvation. All right, so always remember now then that when Adam dropped the ball, when he sinned and he lost dominion over the planet Earth, Satan picked it up, and he's been enjoying that now for 6,000 years. But the day is coming, and we think we're getting closer and closer, when Christ is going to pay off that mortgage that Satan has now been holding on the planet. And that's what the scripture is picturing here. He's holding his control of the planet just like a mortgage. And the reason is that it was something that was God's and handed over to Adam. And what happened? They lost it. They lost it. Satan picked it up. Now, you know, I'm always giving the simple illustration of losing control of something that you've owned. That is, if you take it to a hawk shop and you take whatever they'll give you for it. But the understanding is that you'll someday be able to come back and redeem it by buying it back, by paying the price. Well, that's the perfect picture of redemption all through Scripture. Something that was fully owned is lost and now has to be redeemed. Now, is that so hard to understand? All right, the planet was God's. Give it to Adam. They lost it. Satan picks it up. And now God is going to pay the price to redeem it. Now, we're going to have to go to the book of Ruth after a bit because that explains what chapter 5 is talking about. Without the book of Ruth, it would be pretty hard to define what we're talking about in Revelation 5. But we're going to stay in Revelation 5 first. Don't go back to Ruth just yet. Okay, chapter 5, verse 1. And John writes, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now there again, I have to stop because of all the questions I get of what people are saying. Christ is not sitting on the throne in glory. Who is? Figuratively speaking now, I'm sure that you don't have a literal throne chair and God the Father is sitting there over all the ends of time and then a smaller chair here on which Christ is sitting. But the analogy is that God the Father is seated on the throne in glory and God the Son is beside him sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. That's the way the scripture puts it. Okay, now let's just jump in at verse 7 where now we have God.
God the Son is going to approach God the Father and with the idea in mind of taking the scroll and pay it off. But let's jump back to Daniel and pick up pretty much the same kind of a scene in heaven, which many commentators call identical, but I don't. I, I just can't see that it's the same one because this taking of the scroll in Revelation is at the beginning of the tribulation, getting ready for the horrors of it that are going to follow. But in Daniel, it seems like the same thing, but it can't be because Daniel's vision is now ready for him to take up the kingdom. So let's go back to Daniel chapter 7 just to pick up the scene in heaven. How that God the Son comes before God the Father. Daniel chapter 7 verse 14. All got it? And there was given him. I guess I should go up to 13. Let's go back to 13. And I saw in the night visions and behold one like the Son of Man. Now that's the Son of God. That's Jesus the Christ. And he came with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him, God the Son, near before him, God the Father. And there was given him, the Son, dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Now, you see, that's obvious. He's now ready to take over the kingdom. Well, back here in Revelation, even though it seems like the same, and commentaries will say it is, it can't be because now in Revelation, he's getting ready to introduce the paying off of the mortgage, which is in reality the tribulation, as we're going to see. Okay, so come back with me now then to Revelation chapter 5. And repeat verse 7, where God the Son comes before God the Father, and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat upon the throne. Now down to verse 8. And when he had taken the scroll, this mortgage, the four creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of odors and the incense, you know, which are the prayers of the saints. Now verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, now watch this, Thou, speaking of God the Son, Thou art worthy to take the scroll, the mortgage, and to open the seals thereof. And here's the reason he's worthy. For thou wast slain. See, the death of the cross. For thou wast slain, and you have redeemed us. These are some of the believers here gathered around the throne. And so they've already experienced the redemption, and you have redeemed us to God by thy blood. You remember in our last programs, in the last taping anyway, that was one of the redemptions we looked at. The price of redemption, which was the blood of the Lamb. All right, reading on. For thou wast slain, you have redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. See, now that, that doesn't confine here to the Jew. This is already reaching out to the whole human race in redemption. All right, now, just for sake of interest, let's just turn the page, at least in my Bible, and go on into chapter 6 for a moment. I'm not going to make another study of the seals. But I want you to see that this is the mortgage that Satan is holding on planet Earth and Christ is going to pay it off with the horrors of the tribulation. Now, I know that's probably hard on the surface to explain, but just think. For 6,000 years, what has Satan promoted on planet Earth? Misery and turmoil and heartache, and death, and destruction. That's Satan's bag. Now, in so many words, what's God going to tell him? I'm going to pay you back in full. You're going to get paid back with more misery than you could ever dream of. You're going to get paid back with more death and destruction than you ever dreamed. And that's what the tribulation is going to do, see? All right, so now then in chapter 6, 
this is the first seal taken off of that mortgage. Now, you can't look at the details of the mortgage to take the seals off. Okay, so the first thing that happens then in response to taking off the seals is the introduction of the Antichrist. And there again, that's why I feel people are totally wrong when they think this is the real Christ. It can't be. This is the counterfeit. This is the Antichrist. And I'm always emphasizing that word anti throws a curve at people. They just think it's against Christ. No, the word anti is best defined as the false, the counterfeit Christ. And look how he does it. I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder and one of the four creatures saying, Come and see. Now this is the first opening event of the tribulation. And what is it? The appearance of the Antichrist. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. See, a counterfeit. The true Christ is going to come on a white horse. Absolutely he is. At least symbolically in Revelation 20. So the Antichrist is going to be a counterfeit. So he does the same thing. So he makes his appearance on a white horse. And he that sat on him, that is on the, on the horse, had a bow. And a crown was given unto him. He's going to have great authority. And he goes forth conquering and to conquer. Well, that's the first opening part of the tribulation. Well, that leads into the second, the second seal. And we'll just take a couple of these and then we've got to get back into, no, it's almost six minutes left. All right, so now you take the second seal. And when he opened the second, I heard the second creature say, come and see. And there went out another horse, another event in this seven-year period of horror. And this is the red horse. And I heard the second beast say, come and see, and there went out another horse that was red. The first one was white, speaking of the counterfeit. But now here comes the red horse. And power was given to him that sat upon this red horse to take peace from the earth. Well, what's the opposite of peace? War. So even though we just signed a seven-year peace treaty, seemingly, up in verse 2, this next event is the absence of peace. It's going to have to be war. Well, now, those of you who have heard me teach over the years, I feel that this is the great northern invasion of Ezekiel 38 and 39. And it's going to be headed up by Russia. And I think now, as we're seeing everything come together so fast in the Middle East, I think it'll be Russia and the Muslim world. They're going to come together according to Ezekiel 38 and 39, and they're going to invade Israel. But you see, there's an interesting little tidbit back there in Ezekiel 38, and that is of all the Muslim nations that are listed as coming in with Russia, there's one that is glaringly absent. And who is it? Iraq, Babylon. They're not in there. All the rest of them are. And so, you know, that's why I've been saying now for the last year, this may not be Bush's war after all. This is God's war because we have to get a rock ready for that Babylon, Babylon is fallen. Well, now, what did that all depict back in the book of Revelation here? That this Babylon would be the great commercial center, not just the only one like in New York, but it'll be one. But it'll be a great commercial center. It'll be a city so beautiful it'll knock your eyes out. But in the final hours of this seven years, it too is going to fall. And then that's what Revelation 18 says. Babylon, Babylon is fallen, that great city. And the sailors, and I think they're out on the Persian Gulf, will be able to see the smoke of its burning. And oh, it's coming so fast. Now you've got to stop and just use some common sense. If all this begins to gel and we get peace in Iraq, they've got the second, second largest reserve of oil in the whole world. Now, if oil goes up to $70, $80, $90, a barrel, can you imagine the wealth that will be flowing into Baghdad? It's beyond human comprehension. Well, you see, with that kind of money to play with, they'll be able to build a city like mankind have never built before, and they'll do it probably in less than a year. And that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for this ancient city of Babylon to suddenly just blossom out there in the desert. 
old Saddam Hussein already had a pretty good start, you know, on some of his palaces out there. And uh, with all the oil money flowing into it, you just wait and see. Now, that's my own idea. See, there's one of those things. I don't set that in concrete and say, this is what the Bible says, but I think I'm on the right track that this great war here in uh, the Red Horse or Ezekiel 30, 38 and 39 will be that invasion of the Russians and the Muslim world, and God will destroy them, of course, on the mountains of Israel. Well, then we'll just take one or two more of these, and then this half hour is gone anyway. So just move on down then to verse 5, the third seal. And it too is a horse. In verse 5, I heard the third creature say, Come and see, and I beheld, lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, Bible scholars tell us that these uh, bits of uh, income are enough to serve for a working man to survive for one day. But there's going to be tremendous shortage of food or food grain, feed grains we call it, because I feel of the results of this great Russian invasion, there will be a worldwide calamity on particularly the food production areas of the world our Midwest and the Russian Ukraine and the steppes and so forth. And so all of a sudden, the great food production areas of the world are decimated, which I think will now be the advent of nuclear power. And so the world is now destitute for food. The big food produce, producing areas are wiped out. And so now then you find that you have a pair of balances which indicates food rationing. And so the multitudes of people that have already been killed will be in the major food producing areas and the rest of the world will enter into a time of shortage. Well then I like to move on down with the few seconds I have left is the fourth one and when people think that the first part of the tribulation is going to be a Sunday school picnic they better think again because look what the scripture says that after this next horse has run its course which takes us pretty much up into the seven years that power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, hunger, death, and so forth. So one-fourth of the world's population is going to get wiped out even in the first half of the tribulation. So don't ever think it's going to be something rosy in the first half. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.